Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that uh, song. It's a great song. Love that song. <coughs> thought of uh, Brother Broussard when I heard that. Saw that was on there. That was great. Um, hope you're having a great holiday season. Uh, my grandchildren are at the house with their parents and, and Betty, and they couldn't come this morning, but uh, we're glad that you're here and watching uh, online. I uh, did something that I've, I've never done before. Uh, I changed the sermon. I've done that before between when I wrote one and decided what I was going to preach on. And during one of the quiet times that I had, like about 5 a.m., uh, one morning, I really is probably 4.30, I was thinking, and so uh, what we have today is the envelope sermon. Uh, it has nothing to do with the envelope except my notes are on it. Um, anyway, uh, we'll go from there. Uh, but glad that you're here and hope that uh, we'll uh, gain something from our time together. I was thinking about uh, the greatest story ever told, the greatest, I uh, thought about the greatest love story. Uh, when I think about the story of Jesus, think about the greatest love story ever told. And I thought about, you know, I, I could tell a love story. I could tell about uh, uh, Betty and I and how we got together and how I saw her picture in the newspaper and all this stuff, and you want to know the rest of the story, uh, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Some of you heard it so many times ad nauseum to, to talk <laughs> about it, so uh, not for me, just for you. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I won't go there, but I just and think of Romeo and Juliet or uh, other love stories, but really uh, the story of Jesus. And I was reminded of this as I thought about that is uh, when we were in Australia uh, doing missionary work and teaching Bible class. For the first year, I taught at a town called Blacktown and uh, preached there and taught the Bible classes Wednesday night. And, and then uh, well, the only time we got together with the other team members in Campbelltown was on Tuesday night. That's when we had our midweek service. Uh, but a couple of years after that, we'd moved back. We moved and lived in Campbelltown, but we were at Campbelltown full time. And uh, a lady that we knew in Blacktown, her grandchild lived in Campbelltown. And she asked if we would pick her up and bring her to church. And so we picked this little girl up. She was seven years old. Let's see, Sid and Sloan are eight now, right? So you were seven all last year. Uh, they, so that gives you the idea of, of the size of the child. Uh, we brought her to church, and she'd been in Bible class for three weeks. Betty was teaching the class, and she was talking about Jesus. And the little child looked up at Betty and said, who is Jesus? And she's looking out around the room and she knows this is Johnny, this is Sally. Which one is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And she had no clue who Jesus was. And so as I, I thought about that, I wanted to just think about the, the, the greatest story, uh, a love story. It began uh, in all eternity, before time began. Uh, this being that we call God uh, thought up, decided, I want to create some, something that will love me by their own choice, love me. And so he, with that initial thought, uh, God decided that he would uh, create a, a beautiful world, a universe that is ever expanding, is still expanding. He created a universe, a world for these uh, people, we're going to call them humans, to live. And uh, that story really begins, John chapter 1, verse 1, we can read about that. And so uh, in that story, God developed everything and thought of everything out to the minutest detail. All of creation, all that was going to happen. And in fact, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 to 10, uh, God knew that he would have to send this, this, his son, Jesus, into the world. And he sent him, you know, if we were going to send to say we were going to do something, it would be much different. But God sent a baby. And we read about that story of God, uh, uh, angel talking to Mary in Matthew chapter 1. And we read about uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth uh, cousins having John the Baptist uh, baby uh, be cousin to Jesus and prepare the way in Luke chapter 1. And we read about the birth of Jesus in uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, the beginning part of that chapter and how Mary and Joseph were, were in Nazareth living. 
And God wanted them, he had predicted uh, year, hundreds of years beforehand that the baby would be born in the city of Bethlehem. And so uh, in the works of the, of the world, what was going on in the world, God caused uh, Caesar Augustus to make a decree that all the families should go to their hometown. And so uh, even though Mary was uh, nine months pregnant, or however long it took them to travel, the pregnancy was near the end, but she'd had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And so they traveled uh, to Nazareth, or tra traveled to Bethlehem, uh, probably walking. Maybe she rode on a donkey. Uh, imagine that a few weeks before delivery, riding or, or walking a long distance, too. I mean, that's, that's part of what caused the birth. You know, who knows that? Um, they get to Bethlehem and have a baby. But there's no, there's no hospital. There's no room in the inn. And so they go out in the barn. And, they, and Mary and Joseph deliver a baby. And they call him Jesus because that's what the angel told them to call the baby. Jesus. And the shepherds are out in the field at night and they're watching their flock. And the angels appear in the sky. And they begin to shout and, and, and tell them that uh, to you in the city of David is born a, a, a child who is the Savior, the Christ, our Lord. And so the shepherds run into the city of Bethlehem and they begin to look for where this child might be. And they, they go to the, uh, to, the, to the barn and they find Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And the baby Jesus is swaddled in, in clothes and lying in a manger. And they worship the baby Jesus because that's what the angels had told them to do. A star appears in the sky. And it takes two years or so for the wise men to get to the city of Bethlehem. And there they go to a house and they find uh, the baby Jesus in a house. And they worship the baby Jesus and they bring three kinds of gifts uh, to Mary and Joseph. And an angel in a dream tells Mary and Joseph, you got to get out of town and tells the, the wise men to go by a different way home. And so Mary and Joseph leave and they go down to live in Egypt for a while until Herod dies. Then they move back and they, instead of living in Bethlehem, they go back to Nazareth to live in Nazareth for a while. At age 12, they're bringing Jesus down to the, to the temple. They do that every year. They bring Jesus down to the temple and and they get ready to go home after the feast and the celebration is over and they travel on. They can't find their son Jesus. He's 12 years old and they can't find him. They begin frantically looking for Jesus. You know that feels right, Jeff and Christy, to look frantically for a young boy. They begin frantically looking for uh, Jesus and they go back to the temple and they find him. And he's asking questions and answering questions. And everybody that's in the temple is amazed at how wise and how brilliant this 12-year-old boy is. And Mary, brave soul that Mary is, she says, Jesus, how could you do this to us? And Jesus says, wouldn't you know I'd be about my father's business or in my father's house, depending on your interpretation. He's doing what God wanted him to do. Then there's a space of silence for about 18 years, and Jesus begins his ministry. And uh, we read about it in Matthew chapter 3 and uh, Mark chapter 1 and uh, Luke chapter 3 about Jesus' baptism. And he begins his ministry with a baptism because it was the right thing to do. He had no sins, didn't need to repent of sins. It was the right thing for him to do, to follow God's law. And so he was baptized and begins his ministry and begins to go out and, and to preach and teach. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is coming. And he performed great and wondrous, beautiful miracles. Cured people of illnesses. We don't know how many people he cured. Because a lot of times in the text it says many other people were cured by Jesus. But I know some, we know about a leper who walked around the city of Jerusalem or walked around uh, Capernaum probably where he's living at that time, Capernaum walks around yelling, unclean, unclean so people would stay away from him kind of like we wear masks today no, just kidding he 
yelled unclean. And Jesus ignores the warning to stay back. And Jesus walks up to him and he touches him. And instantly, just like that, he's cured of his leprosy. And Jesus tells him to go and show the priest and perform the sacrifice for the cleansing. And Jesus heals many people like that. Uh, John chapter 9 talks about a nobleman's, or 5 talks about a nobleman's son that was cured. Long distance, if you will, where Jesus just said the word, go, your son lives. And the man went and he was cured at that very hour. Or Jesus uh, cured a man that was born blind. Never, something like that has never happened before. No one ever recovered blindness when they were born blind. And yet this man who was blind, Jesus healed him. And he didn't even know who he was. Jesus performed many wonderful and raised the dead. John chapter 11, Lazarus, his, one of his really close friends, is sick and Jesus knows that he doesn't go back on purpose and he allows Lazarus to die. And he waits with Mary and Martha and he's talking to them on the way uh, back home to, to, to console them. They're grieving for their brother who has died. And he talks about, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And they said, yeah, we do, but I'm not sure they understood what he meant. And as Mary comes to the tomb where Lazarus is. Jesus sees her and she is weeping and sobbing because her brother is dead. And Jesus sees her and he's touched by her grief. He understands our pain. He understands our sorrow. He knows what's going on. And he's touched by that. Text says he's moved with compassion and Jesus wept. The Greek word is wept bitterly. He cried like Mary was crying. And I find that truly amazing that Jesus cried the way Mary was crying because Jesus knew that in just a few seconds he was going to say, Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus was going to rise up out of the tomb and walk out. Bundled up though he was. And yet he is weeping. Because he saw the pain of his good friend, Mary and Martha. And he knows your pain. He knows your suffering. He sees and he cares. And Jesus was, we could go on and on about the miracles. Jesus also was the greatest teacher ever known. He taught people uh, wondrous, beauteous, beautiful things. As he, as he starts with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, talking about the kingdom and your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees to, to be able to enter the kingdom. and talks about a lot of kingdom things. And he's just taught one of the great texts in it, love your neighbor. No, love your enemies. It's easy to love our neighbor. It's easy to love people that are like you and I. But it's much more difficult to love people that are completely different. Believe differently. Whether it's politically or whatever. Love everyone. Jesus did. And he talks parables. Oh, we could talk about the parables. Go on and on about the parables. The pearl of great price. The parable of the, as I mentioned in the Bible class, uh, we, they call it in your Bible the parable of the sower. I call it the parable of the soils about people's hearts. And parable upon parable. And some of the parables were worded in such a way that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't know what he was talking about. The disciples didn't. It, it, even the parable of the sowers, which seems so easy for us, it's easy because we read what he says when he tells what it means. The apostles didn't understand the meaning, and, and Jesus would often explain it to them. Uh, but he was the great, wondrous teacher, teaching so many wonderful things. And then there's a point in the text where it says, Jesus turned his face. See, I should look this way. 
Jesus turned his face to Jerusalem. He set his path to Jerusalem. He knew what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And he went anyway. He knew that when he got to Jerusalem, he was going to have to die. You know, Christianity is the only religion known to man where God dies for man. Jesus died for me. Amen. Jesus died for you. There's where the amen comes. Amen. I'm glad he died for me. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad Jeff's glad he died for me, too. But we're glad he died for each one of us. Jesus died for us. But not only did he die for us and pay the penalty for our sin, he was resurrected never to die again, which gives us a hope of eternal life. And I know as you think about that story, you think it's uh, the greatest story ever told. I want to read a verse of scripture for us now. One that I don't have to read. I have it memorized. Most of you do too. For God so loved the world. If you would, if you write in your Bible, cross out world and write your name there. If it's your personal Bible. If you're giving it to somebody, giving them a Bible, cross out world and write their name in it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Those are the greatest words ever written. They're the greatest words. This is the greatest love story ever told because it tells us several things. One about the greatest being there ever was, God. For God. As I talked about at the beginning, God in eternity thought about this, figured it all out, laid it all out, and created this world for us. Created a world that <coughs> The days are getting longer now. Six, day, six, six days we've been getting longer. And I'm glad we're getting longer. I can't wait till they're longer so you can have a little time uh, after you get home from work to, to do something outside and it's warm enough outside. Uh, I love this time of year, but once pheasant season is over, then it's let's go warm up and have <laughs> turkey season. It's springtime here. Let's have some days are getting on. God created how that all works. I, I was substitute teaching one time uh, here in Manford for uh, fourth grade, I believe. They had me do it one day. There's a reason for that. <laughs> had to do it one day when we were talking about the earth on its axis and the axis and its turning and how it, it changes in the times of seasons. And, and one of the kids said, why is it that way? And I said, God made it that way. And he said, you can't talk about God in class, in school. I said, I can't. I'm just a substitute teacher. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so that, I've never been asked to substitute again. Uh, but God made it that way. He created this world with all of its beauty and all of its wonder. Uh, just for us to live on. So that we could uh, know there is a God. And not only that, we can know uh, that this greatest being that created this shared the greatest emotion of all time, love. God loved us so much, he created this world for us. He loved us so much, he sent Jesus to die for us. And he wants us to choose to love him. You know, there's a lot of people that are easy to love. And really, in a lot of ways, it's easy to love God, isn't it? You think of all that he's done for us, it's easy to love God until it comes time to sacrifice. Then sometimes it's not so easy to love God. But we love him anyway because you know what God did in his love? He sacrificed. And so we learn about that emotion of, of love and, and sacrifice and praise God for what he's done for us. And then it gives us, the, the text also talks about the greatest um, condition, if you will, or the, the uh, object of the love is, is you and me. He loved us. And tells about the greatest condition or requirement 
Uh, for him is believing, having faith, and that is the beginning of everything. If you want to become a Christian, if you want to live for Jesus, if you want to be a great Christian, it all starts with faith. It all starts with that first action of faith in following God. You know, the children of Israel uh, died in the wilderness because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 18 says. They died because of unbelief and they saw God as a cloud of, in the daytime and God as a pillar of fire by night. They saw the Red Sea parted and they walked through on dry ground. They saw the Red Sea close over the Egyptians after they passed and drowned all the Egyptian soldiers that were following them. They saw God lead them across the desert, feeding them every day, watering them every day, clothing them every day, or made their clothes last 40 years. You think my suit lasts that long, but it probably won't. 40 years, God took care of them, and they said, he can't give us the promised land. And the text says, because it wasn't united with faith. Faith is the beginning point. Faith is the middle point. Faith is the end point. You see, faith carries all the way through in our living for Jesus. And it also tells us about the greatest consequences of whether we have faith or don't have faith. Eternal punishment, eternal salvation. Eternal death or eternal life. What a love story. Because God wants eternal life for every one of us. You know, the, the thing that we can get most out of the story of Jesus is that God, i.e. Jesus, loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. He wants you to spend eternity with him. You see, God has done all of this. He's laid this story out for us, plain and simple, in God's word. And now the ball, so to speak, is in your court. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? How will you respond? He gave his life for you. Will you give his, your life for him? If you're not a Christian, you can begin that by a step of faith that confesses Jesus as Lord and submits to the waters of baptism to rise and walk in a new kind of life to live for Jesus. If you're already a Christian, living powerfully for Jesus each and every day. Because you know what? Jesus raised his arms and said, I love you. How will you respond to Jesus? We're going to sing a song to encourage you to respond to Jesus. Won't you come while we stand, while we sing?